I want to thank Mr. Sen and the organizers for inviting me to this. I've heard the uh, previous two speakers, and it really, they couldn't have organized, none of us saw what the other person was going to say, but I think um, my talk will illustrate that this was very good planning in terms of getting the various speakers uh, over here. Uh, and a lot of what I will say will be complementary, uh, not as in, will be in addition to um, what has been said before. And there might be some minor differences, but then, you know, you can't have two economists and not have four opinions. So I'll try and uh, play the role of an economist. Okay, the topic given to me is removing barriers to growth. And both the previous speakers talked about indirectly or directly about such barriers. Now, if I look at the record of India's or Bharat's rate of growth over the last, uh, let us say, since 1980, it broadly is in three phases. Um, from 1980 to 2002, uh, India grew at a very respectable rate of 5.5%. From 2002 to 2008-9, Bharat grew at a more than respectable rate of somewhere like 8.5% or so, annualized average rate. And after that, disaster struck. So if we are talking about removing barriers to growth, we need to find out what was the disaster that happened in the previous five to six years. If we are able to identify that, then, if you will, removal of that should get us back to where we started. Now, there are two views about, in general, whenever the, there's talk about the Indian economy, whether by politicians or by, or especially by politicians, or by economists, etc., that, listen, how much of it is our fault and how much of it is the foreign hand, the developed countries, um, what's happening in the rest of the world? And, you know, no matter how hard you try, it turns out, forget the foreign hand. It's very convenient to blame things on somebody else. The fault is right here, is by our policymakers, is in Bharat itself. It is not something manufactured either in the US or in England or in Europe or in China or somewhere else. As Bibek emphasized, we live in a globalized world. In a globalized world, everybody is interdependent on everybody else. So I must say I, I disagree a little bit with what the minister had to say, that the US economy and the German economy, et cetera, is dependent on us. I think that is getting back to the thinking that we are all important. We are not all important. We are a small country in GDP terms, not in, uh, if you will, population terms, obviously. And, and to say that the rest of the world is dependent on us for growth, I think, is to mislead uh, and to not give the accurate picture. We have to take the world as is. That is one of the most important lessons, I think, that we can take from the experience of various countries around the world for, if you will, decades, if not centuries. So therefore, let us not try, first and most important, to put the blame on somebody else. I didn't do anything there. That is not, I think, very productive. It doesn't get you very far, and I think it is far from accurate as a description of what happened. So now let's look at what really happened in the last six years that if you will, virtually destroyed the economy. Most important was the fact that inflation went out of control. Why did inflation go out of control? Well, inflation went out of control because the political economy or the version of the political economy that the UPA had was, if you will, completely erroneous and certainly not very beneficial to India or to Bharat. 
that version was, listen, we've got the farmers, we've got to protect the farmers, and the reason we've got to protect the farmers is because we need their votes. It is not that they should have good incomes, that they, we will pursue this policy. It is that we needed their votes. Now, think about this. Over the previous six years, India's inflation rate has been above 10%, which is the highest on record. Never before in India in 66 years history has the inflation rate been so high for six consecutive years. Now, I lie a little bit, and that is the following, that our inflation rate over the previous six years was 10.1%, whereas in 1975, after the OPEC price increase of 400%, India's inflation rate went up to 10.5%. But that was a very unusual international circumstance. And so therefore, we can be very confident that what happened in the last six years was purely manufactured at home. And if you will, proof that it was purely manufactured at home is that inflation rates, every part of the world went down post the 2008-9 crisis. Only in Bharat did the inflation rate not only go up, but almost doubled. Forget almost, doubled. Because we were averaging about 4.5%, 5% inflation. Now we averaged 10 to 10.5 average inflation. OK, so basically, two points. First, what does impact growth? are domestic events, domestic policies, and international events. The international events are really almost inconsequential in terms of affecting an economy like ours. So therefore, let us concentrate on what we can do in terms of removing barriers to growth within our economy. I will list <coughs> basically Yeah, so to summarize, and actually another important event of the last six years was that other than now in the price of oil, which has fallen, the price of oil stayed relatively stable at about $105 to $110 uh, per barrel. International economy, that is to say growth rates in the world economy improved gradually, albeit at a very low level, but they improved. While the international economy improved upwards, we went downwards. And the third part, and as I already mentioned, that inflation was falling. So therefore, I think from that, I conclude that international events had zero role in affecting our economy, and our domestic events had a great role. What were the domestic events then that affected our economy? First, I will talk about the non, so-called non-economic but political factors that affected our economy. We had this great idea of dual centers of power, the CEO and the manager, whatever it was concocted. But basically, Manmohan Singh thought, or we think he thought one way, Sonia Gandhi thought another way, and what you got was either a hodgepodge or, if you will, what Sonia Gandhi wanted. So therefore, dual centers of power was one of the major constraints to our economic growth over the last six years. Second, I think you know, we have to be honest and look at what basically, in terms of the corruption scams, the role of the CAG and Vinod Rai uh, as its leader, and that role was to exaggerate beyond any logic the losses that were being incurred by corruption, if you will. So this affected sentiment, and, and clearly uh, people, bureaucrats were not willing to make decisions. Everything came to a standstill. But it came from, if you will, this very aggressive, moralistic attitude of the CAG in order to put out wild estimates of uh, losses that were occurring from, just to give you an example, uh, the coal uh, estimates, which is one of the big scams, 
that basically the CAG had forecast, if you will, growth in revenues without applying any discount factor. So the, one of the first principles in accounting is that you basically discount the future because a rupee today is worth much more than a rupee tomorrow because of inflation and, if you will, the interest rate. So these factors, then confidence in India basically declined. And nobody was willing to take decisions. The economy was going downhill. And if you will, the political actors were acting in their political self-interest rather than in the interest of Bharat. Last but not least was what I call the Neanderthal retrospective tax, which was introduced by the previous government uh, in terms of, um, uh, what was it, 2011 or 12, where the logic of that actually uh, confounds everybody. But, and this is just to show you where we have gone wrong, the Supreme Court also, if you will, introduced a retrospective tax when it said, or retrospective decision, when it said that, listen, we will go back to the coal allocations back to 1993. Now, you know, I think one of the major constraints on the Indian economy is, if you will, what, you know, that the Supreme Court is acting in areas that it has very little competence in, I will say that, in economic terms. And the political authorities, if you will, in the previous administration acted, if you will, towards getting elected. There was the uh, accounting CAG, which was looking for its own future. So we had a real mess up in terms of the environment. Therefore, what is to be done? Now, I think, you know, part of the way we should look at the election results is that people, what I've been saying, people fully saw this. They said that, listen, the previous government had failed, not only failed, but failed miserably. We want policy making, active policy making, and if you will, logical policy making in order to get the Indian economy to its growth path of seven, eight, nine percent, which, if you will, is our potential growth rate. And this is, you know, one other point that I want to make on this is that you have people saying, that, listen, you know, we're growing at five percent, and there's the U.S. growing at one percent. What's your problem? Now, the problem is that nobody should ever compare growth rates in absolute terms. It is your potential growth rate, what you're capable of. That is, if you're growing below what you're capable of, that's a problem. So if India's potential GDP growth rate is 8%, we're growing at 5 We are doing a lot worse than the US, whose potential growth rate is 2.5% and is growing at 2 So therefore, it is not that the rest of the world is, is if you will, not growing as fast as they should. They are. It is we are growing slower than we should, and that is what needs to be corrected. So I will basically conclude with two or three observations. One of them was made by uh, the, uh, one of the questions earlier. That look, if I look at the interest rates, and I can speak on interest rates because I'm not a member of the government, I'm not a member of the RBI, but basically interest rates in India are completely out of whack. They make no logical sense. Inflation has, if you will, collapsed, literally collapsed, to somewhere around 5%, and I think is well on its way towards 4% over the next year, which is a very sensible rate of inflation. But that rate of inflation, if you will, is completely inconsistent with the RBI keeping interest rates very high. And that, if you will, affects the cost of capital, that affects job uh, creation, that affects incomes, that affects the entire economy down the line. Do not underestimate the impact that interest rates can do, just like you shouldn't underestimate what politicians, how they can mess up the economy. So therefore, do not underestimate what can be done and how messed up you can be if you do not have your interest rates right. In, in India, a firm is paying something like 13, 14%. 
In China, the firm is paying 4% to borrow. Listen, it goes into your competitiveness. So you might go ahead and say, listen, we are very good, this, that, whatever, but you really cannot compete. It just doesn't make sense. So therefore, to conclude, one, I think the environment needs to change. And thankfully, I believe the environment has changed rather radically for the better. Second, I think interest rates need to fall in order that that's a major barrier to growth. And third is let's identify how we can achieve our destiny and our potential of 8% GDP growth, and let's concentrate on that. Thank you.